celebrated, but let's stand to our feet and let's tell the Lord we're worthy of our love. How much we love him tonight. Can you do that? Can you take a few moments yes. just to tell him you love him? Just because of who he is, would you do that, please? Dear Heavenly Father, God, we love you today. God, we just honor you and we thank you for who you are. God, you're worthy, Father God. Lord, of all of our praise and all of our glory and all of our honor, Father God. God, you're worthy, Jesus, of our highest praise, Father God. And I do, I do. My heart is, is filled with love and adoration for you today, Father. God, you are the beat of my heart, Father God. You are the breath of my lungs, Father. God, and you are the very reason that I am alive today, Father. And I thank you for that, and I love you. And I, God, teach me how to love you more deeply, Father God. Teach me, Lord Jesus, how to express my love, Father God. How to pour my love out on you, Father. God, I thank you for who you are, God. And I just honor you today. God, on this man-made holiday, Father God, every day you're worthy of our love. Father God, you're worthy of our adoration and our praise, Father God. And we just pour that out on you. God, I pray that you would rest upon your people tonight, Father. God, I pray that you would move in our hearts and move in our lives, Father God. That you would give us eyes to see you tonight, Father God. Purify our eyes so that we can see you rightly, Father. God, purify our ears, Father God, so that we can hear your spirit speaking to us, Father God, tonight. God, help us to understand. Give us a mind to know you, Father God. And give us a heart that will trust you and obey you, Father God. God, give us a mouth that will praise you and that will pour out and lavish praise on you, Father God. Give us hands that will serve and be your hands and give us feet that will run. Father God, rest among us tonight. Holy Spirit, I thank you for who you are. Teach us to pray. I ask y'all to name. Amen. So, we're talking about prayer. Um, last week, um, we ended with Jehoshaphat, right? And we were talking, we're talking about the first part of Father who art in heaven. Tonight, we're going to try to get that last part, hallowed be thy name, right? So we're, what we're talking about today, and, and we have been talking about the last few weeks, I'm going to try to get through this quickly, um, but I, I made no promises. Um, but right, if, if prayer can be taught, then prayer can be learned, right? Because that's what the disciples said. What did they ask Jesus to do? Jesus. Teach me to pray. Out of all of the things they could have asked him, they saw something in his prayer life that they wanted. Right? And that's important. we got to understand that. Nothing else, I mean, it all starts with prayer. If Jesus had to pray, we have to pray. Amen. Right? We can't, get, we can't get by without it. Right? Amen. So that, that's where we're at. We talked about last week about... Um, you know, uh, our Father, understanding that He's our Father um, and that He's in heaven. And today we're going to talk about the Hallowed Be Thy Name, right? And if you go back to the first week we talked about, this is this is kind of all part of this praise and adoration in prayer, right? We start our prayer. We always should start our prayer with acknowledging Him, with giving Him praise and adoration and worship, right? Um, why? Because that puts Him in the proper perspective. Right? Because how many of you have problems? Right? How, right? how many of us have problems? Yeah. How many of you know if you focus on your problems, your problems will be bigger than your God? Anybody? Yeah. Right? If your problems seem too big, it's because you're looking at them. Look to Jesus. That's, that's the reality of it. Right? Because he is bigger than your problems. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, we'll probably spend some time in the book of Daniel. He always shifts things on me. I always have a plan. And then he always like like blows me up in the morning um, or this afternoon and he took me to Daniel um, and we're gonna I'm gonna try to tie it together I may fail at that but at least it'll hopefully be a good word because it's from his word but talking about hallowed be thy name right to hallow means to honor means to worship right so there's two imperatives for prayer prayer has to begin with worship the, of the Father the mighty one it has to that has to be the place, right? And what does worship mean? It's to acknowledge their work, right? You think of worship as worship, right? They're worthy, right? We, 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 we worship a lot of things, do we not? Do we worship a lot of things that really aren't worthy of our worship? I mean, if we're honest, right? A lot of things get our attention, a lot of things get our worship, 
Um, and we give a lot of honor and reverence to things that maybe don't don't deserve it, but he deserves it. He is the one that is worthy. So let me give out some scripture. Someone um, just turn to the book of Daniel. We're gonna we're gonna start there. Daniel four. Um, yep, Daniel four. We're gonna start there. We're gonna stay in the book of Daniel for a, a little bit. See how I can tie this all together. Um, don't know that I can. But Daniel 4, 34 and 35. Uh, and this is a prayer of, of Nebuchadnezzar. Right? Who was Nebuchadnezzar? Does anybody know who Nebuchadnezzar was? He was, what kind of king was he? Hmm? Was, he a, was he a Jewish king? He was a Babylonian king. Right? Because remember, they were in captivity. Right? Daniel was brought into captivity. So this was not a God of Israel, right? He was not the king of Israel. Um, because that got, if you remember, that got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel in a lot of trouble, right? Because they didn't worship the God of Israel. So this is a foreign king. And man, when you, you, when you read this, um, this is his prayer. And I want you to think about I'm going to get there, and I'm probably going to be all over the place tonight, so just try to run with me, because um, I got everything running around in my mind right now. But you, you, you think about Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to set the story, right? They were brought into captivity. They were probably 15, 16 years old. These were not adults, right? These were not grown men. These were young men. And um, But there was something about them, right? They were praying. Uh, because the book of Daniel is filled with things that God did in and through these four young young men, and this is what um, you know. In, in this in this portion of Scripture, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have been delivered from the fiery furnace, um, and Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and Daniel interprets the dream. Right, and again, this isn't like I didn't know our God, but through David's prayer life. I want you to read what Nebuchadnezzar prayed. Someone read um, Daniel 4, 34 and um, 35. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes unto heaven, and my understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored them that live forever. Right, so stop right there for a second. So this is a pagan king, right? But what does he do? How does he start his prayer? He looked at his eyes. And what did he do? He blessed the Most High. Right? He blessed the Most High. Right? And this, he, he got it. He, I, he must have heard Daniel pray enough to know this is how I have to pray. I have to start by acknowledging the Most High. Right? Do you see that there? And, um, and he praised him, right? He acknowledged him, he praised him, he blessed him, and he honored him. Who did he honor? Him who does what? eternal one. Go ahead. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? Yeah, right? So you got this. You, you get this, and this, this is what just kind of stuck in my head. My spirit this last week is that this is a king that didn't know our God. But look at what he knows about our God. Right? If you look at the, let's just, what did he say about him? He's the most high. He lives forever. His dominion is what? Everlasting. So what does that tell you about him? Who is this God that you serve? What does it mean that his dominion is everlasting? He's always everlasting. He's always, right? He will always be the one that has dominion. His kingdom is from generation to generation. What does that tell you? It's on and on. It's on and on, right? His kingdom never ends, right? <laughs> Righteousness, peace, and joy the, it never ends. His kingdom never ends. Uh, he does according to his will, right? And no one can restrain his hand. What does that tell you about him? He's all powerful, isn't he? So if we'll take the time to read scripture and meditate on it, 
and think about what it's saying to us instead of just getting through a chapter, right? Because this says a lot about who God is and about how we pray. Again, this is a pagan king praying this. And, it, and so when you come to God, right, you're coming to the one who is greater and mightier than yourself. That's what, that, king, this is a king, right? This is a king who has power. <coughs> but he's acknowledging that I don't have more power than the God of Israel. He's greater than I am, right? And when we get to the place where we understand that worship will take us to the place where complaining won't, right? Let me say that again. Worship will take you to the place where complaining can't take you, right? Let me say that one more time. Worship will take you places where complaining won't even get you in the door, right? And that's important because that... Worship changes your perspective, right? It magnifies your God instead of magnifying your problem. And that's the whole purpose of it. He loves to hear our worship, but I would say worship does just as much good for us because it puts the focus on where it belongs. Has anybody ever experienced that? Has anybody ever experienced where you were you were just weren't feeling it? But all of a sudden, pastor said, when I start to pray, something changes in me. When I start to acknowledge who he is, I realize that, you know what, I don't have anything to worry about. And, and I think that that's the question later on in Daniel in chapter 9. Maybe it's not chapter 9. Um, and maybe it is in chapter 9. No, it's in, in cha chapter 6 when Daniel was in the lion's den. I told him it would be all over the place tonight. The king, at Darius... King Darius asked Daniel, right? This is after Daniel was thrown in the lion's den. And King, King Darius said in verse 20, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able, been able to deliver you from the lions? So maybe that's the question we need to start asking yourself. Was he able? Right? Not is he able, was he able? Because he was able. And that if you read back, he says, but the king spoke, saying to Daniel, your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Again, another king, pagan king saw something in Daniel and saw something about Daniel and Daniel's God that said, hey, they, and Darius didn't want him to throw. You look in the other chapter and, and in verse four of chapter six, and it says they, they didn't like Daniel, but it said that they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful nor was there any error found in him. Can I tell you why I think that was? Because he was a man of prayer, yeah. right? When you're a person of prayer, they won't find any error in you, right? When, you're, when you are living in the presence of the king, when you are constantly before his throne, when you're constantly in his presence and you get a glimpse of who he is and how sinful you are, it changes you, right? They, they could find no fault. They could find nothing in his character to accuse him of. Do you get that? So they said, well, let's attack his faith. That's all that they had to attack was his faith because his faith was, faith was that strong. So they said, let hey, king issue a decree because they knew that this was the only way that they could get Daniel. Issue a decree, king, that says nobody can pray to any other God except your God. That they can't pray to a, the God of Israel. And the king signed it, and then he regretted it, didn't he? He didn't, he liked, he liked, I, I, this blows my mind, the favor that Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had with all these foreign kings that didn't serve their God. But I'm telling you, when you are a person of prayer, God gives you favor with your enemy, right? And that's what we see, and we see that, so they could find no fault. So Daniel said, I can't, you know, I can't, you can't pray, Daniel, you can't pray to your God. But what did Daniel do? He defied, right? You got, you know, this is a boldness that you have to have, right? And when you know the, who your God is. And that's the other thing I see about Daniel is he knew who he, his God was, right? We talked about that, that last week. We got to know who we're praying to. We're, we got to know that he's our father. And we got to know who he is. He's the God that, he's our father that lives in the heavens. He's above everything. Right? And, and when you know that, then you can stand up and you can go and you can fly open your windows. And you can defy the king and you can pray outside of your window three times a day without fear of any retribution. Because it doesn't matter, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, hey, we know that our God is able to deliver us. But even if it doesn't, we're still going to serve our God. We will never bow to your God. 
And I think that that's what I see about prayer is understanding that when we have that prayer life, it changes us, it builds faith in us, and we become lion tamers. We defy the laws of fire, right? That, that we'll come out unharmed and un, 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 not even singed with anything, right? But that's what I see in Daniel is he was a praying person. And, and he knew his God. And, and, it, and if you look in the first chapter of Daniel, and this spoke to me today in verse 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's food. Can I tell you that that's what some of us need to do tonight? We need to purpose in our heart that we won't defile ourselves with the food that this world has to offer us, right? That we will not pull up a seat at the table that this world has for us. Because can I tell you, it is appealing, right? It looks good, it tastes good, it feels good for a moment, right? But it will defile you. And that's what we need to be careful is about pulling up and eating from the table of bitterness, pulling up a seat and eating from the table of complaining and griping, pulling up and eating from a table of unforgiveness and, and, and popularity and pride, right? I don't think I need to talk about the table of, of you know, other, the big major sins that we talk about, but let's talk about the ones that we're living in, right? The ones that are affecting us, right? And those, those are real and the enemy is, 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 he, he's, he's easy for him to get us to that table, right? And it's easy for him to keep us in that place because for the moment, man, we feel good in that space, right? That's right. But before long, that gets a grip on us, right? We, we don't, you know, when, something, when someone wrongs us, we don't want to forgive them. You know, we, we, we want them to, you know, we want to withhold that thinking it hurts them. It doesn't do anything except hurt you, right? And it doesn't do anything except create bitterness, right? Mm. Anybody ever been bitter? Right? I talk, I taught that you can be bitter or you can be better. Always choose better. Right? Always choose better. But this is what you see in Daniel. You got a purpose in your heart that you will not defile yourself with the king's food. Right? You got a seat at his table. And that's and and, and you know, to me, this all comes down to do I know who he is? Do I, do I honestly understand and do I know who he is, right? Because if I know him and I understand who he is and I understand his name, right? And I understand that his name is one that's to be honored and hallowed and to be regarded as holy and it's to be reverenced, right? It testifies of his character. And if you know who he is, I'm telling you, that gives you confidence to ask him and to trust him and to do what he asks you to do. Right? And we've talked about this before. If you've asked someone to do something for you and they've never done it, are you gonna, if you ask them to do something and they tell you they're gonna do it, what are you gonna say? Flip a coin? They may or may not. Right? But there are certain people that you know if you, if they tell you they're going to do something, that they're going to do it. Why? Because they've never let you know. They've always done it. Or if they couldn't, they communicated and they got to, right. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's integrity. And that's what God is. He's a person of his word, right? He cannot lie. And when we understand that about him, that gives us a power and a faith when we ask, right? When we come before him because we know that he's never failed me yet, right? I have 66 books of people that he never failed. We talked about Elijah last week, did we not? Why could Elijah go and say it's not going to rain? Because he knew the word, and he knew that God can't lie, and he knew that if, if Israel was in sin, that that was the curse that God said he was going to bring on the land, that it wouldn't rain. Israel was in sin. He just told him what God said he was going to do in faith, and he believed that God was going to do it, and it happened. And he also knew that if Israel would repent, what would God do? He would bring rain. Israel repented. So what did he have the authority to do? Go and pray for rain, and the rain came. Right? Because he knew the word, he knew his God, and he believed it. Does that make sense? And that's the place that we need to get to. We're, and that's what looking and praying a prevailing prayer looks like. So I'm gonna, um, I'll just hand this out. I would encourage you, we'll, we'll talk about it briefly. I don't know that I've made enough for everybody so we can share it for a couple. Um, but these are just some of the names of God, right? You have to understand that in scripture, right? Their names meant something. 
Um, oh, hey. um, right? Some of us pick names because we like the way they sound. Anybody ever pick their name because they like the way they sound? But who picked a name for their child because you like the meaning of it? Who us did. All of them? Both of them? No? Right? One of them because you liked it, one of them because you liked what it meant? Yeah? I, I'm not gonna lie, I like the way Brittany sounded. I honestly couldn't even tell you what it means. But I was in my, I was a senior in high school and one of my classmates was pregnant and she brought a baby book to school and this was in the 80s. Um, and Brittany was a name that you didn't hear about. It was a very uncommon name and I didn't like, I didn't, I always wanted to be different. Um, and so I didn't know any Britneys. I never heard of that name before. I'm like, that's what I'm going to name my child. By the time the 90s came and she was born, everybody's a Britney now. Um, so I was ahead of the game. I picked it first. Um, no, you didn't name after Britney Spears. No, 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 no. No, I, I picked that name in 1983. I, I did. I picked that when I was my... Um, my senior year of high school, and it was probably in the fall, and one of my one of my classmates was pregnant. She had her baby book, and we were looking through it, her baby name book. And uh, yeah, and that's what I picked. So eighty three. Yes. I uh, so Gabby, because um, Gabby was kind of unexpected. It had Bella, and then um, we found out we were having Gabby, and we were struggling with the name. I mean, we just knew we were talking about Bella. I remember walking through Walmart, and I'm at Walmart Target, and uh, there was a little girl, cute little girl, and her mom said, Gabby, Gabriella, and that's the name. Yeah. And because uh, I had a dream that that's what Gabby was going to look like. And Gabby was just, I'm still to this day, looks like that. You know what I'm wow. saying? It just looked good. So it was kind of weird how we did that. Yeah, I, and it did, but in the Bible, names meant something, right? They would name them because of a character, or they, you know, or they would attach that name to that characteristic. But th these are names of God. So take a few minutes to look through this list because this is important. If you don't know who he is, this is probably not all, all inclusive. Um, but I'm telling you, he is. Who, who believes that he's everything that you need? Right? Do we believe that? Um, I have a couple other ones. I, can, I have some more. Debbie, do you want one? No, we'll share. Here's another. I've got some of them. I have another. I have a couple more. Some of the last ones. Yeah. Uh, so So there they are. So we. Uh, oh, I gave my my one over here. So think about these names. We'll just we'll read through them. L just means the strong one. Does that, does that excite you? Yes. Right? He's the strong one. He's more powerful than any God, and he will overcome all obstacles. What does that do for you? But when we know that, when can I pray that? When can I call on L? Right? When I'm feeling overwhelmed, when I'm feeling defeated, right? He's the strong one. When I'm running, when I'm running low on energy, right? When I'm feeling weak, he's the strong one. He's Elohim, he's the creator. He's all powerful creator of the universe. Now, what does that, go ahead, Pastor. Well, I was just going to say, the good thing about that, oh, he, that's the plural for L. Yeah. So you got L, and, you know, oh, he, people should yep. ask me and make the plural. L, oh, he, is the plural for L. It's not like there's multiple gods. It's, it's, it's the complex. Trinity. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's proof that we, the Trinity yeah, God. Yeah, that, that is. And this is, he's the creator, and you see the creator at, you know, you see this in Genesis, the first chapter of Genesis, and in the first chapter of John, in the beginning, God created and the spirit was hovering over the face of the deep and in John 1 Jesus said in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God so you see the three you see the trinity so that is very true this is what this thing Elohim means and it's the trinity and you know someone said that when they think about the trinity they look at it like this Satan took a third of heaven's angels with him so you got Satan and a third of heaven's angels and you've got God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and two-thirds of heaven's angels. He's outnumbered five to two, right? So, so, right, and that's the reality of it. He is not more powerful than our God, right? He is the all-powerful one. He created everything. If he created, if he can speak nothing, speak something out of nothing, then what is too difficult for him? Right, we're going to get to that in, in, in Jeremiah 32 in a second. But he's Elyon. He's the most high. Right? That means he's the sovereign God. What does that mean? What does it mean to know that he's sovereign? Right? He knows exactly what he's doing. 
right? Someone explained the sovereignty of God that before it touches you, it first has to go through his hands, right? Nothing can come to you before it passes through his hand. So if it comes to you, he will get you through, Amen. right? He won't bring you to something without the promise of getting you through something, right? And you see that in Isaiah 40, right? You'll go through the fire, you'll go through the flood, and it won't harm you, right? He never said that we wouldn't go through the flood. His word just said the opposite. You will go through the flood. You will go through the fire. And the New Testament said you will have persecution. You will have tribulation. It's going to come. It's part of life. We're going to have to live with difficulty. But we can have joy and we can have peace and we can come through it, you know, right? Like Daniel did um, in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So he's the sovereign God and we can trust him. And I think that that's important. I love El Elyon because it means I don't have to understand. I just have to trust. How many of you know that you're probably not going to understand too much that happens in life? Because his ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not my thoughts, right? Anybody? Anybody ever experienced God's doing something way out of what you wanted it to look like? Yes. yes. And you, we get mad sometimes, don't we? Yes. We get frustrated. We get discouraged. How many of us keep praying for the answer when he's already given us the answer, but it's not the answer that we want? Yes. So we keep praying, thinking he's going to give me another answer, right? Yes. But he's sovereign, and he, he knows, and I can trust him in every situation. Right? I gave you those. You can go ahead and do these. We'll just talk quickly through some of them. He's the eternal or everlasting God. You know what this excites me about? Because when the enemy comes and reminds me of my past, I say, you know what? My past has been redeemed because he's still back there. Amen. Right? His blood still covers what's back there. You have nothing, right? You have no right to bring that up to me. He's in the past. I don't have to worry about tomorrow because he's in my tomorrow. Right? He's from, he's eternal. He's from everlasting to everlasting. He's the all sufficient, or he's El Roy, the God who sees me. Then I never have to feel alone. Right? I have to, I never have to I am never forgotten. I am never alone. I, I am I'm he's always sees me. Right? You ever have a little kid and they thought you had eyes in the back of your head because you always knew what they were doing, right? Uh -huh. That's how it is with God. You're not fooling. You might be fooling people, but you're never fooling him. And I don't know about you, but I find that comforting. Because I want someone to know what I'm doing. Right? I don't want to live in, this, in a secret. Right? Because that's when bad things happen. In secrecy. Right? Is it true? Is it true? Does anything good happen in, in the, in, other than with the secret place with him? In the natural, nothing, nothing good happens in secret. When we start hiding things, it usually doesn't end well. Does it? No, it always comes to light. That's his word. So he's the God who sees, and he's the God that loves me and convicts. He's El Shaddai, the all-sufficient one. That means he literally is everything that we need. There is nothing that we need that he doesn't have. He is Jehovah. He is the self-existent one. He is the one who always was. He is the I am, right? He is Jehovah Sidkenu. He's, he's our righteousness, right? He's the one that makes us righteous. He's our provider, He's our shepherd. He's our peace. I'm just going through these quickly. He's our banner. He's our healer, right? It's the, the Jehovah Shema. He's the, he's, he's the God of glory, and his glory has filled the temple. He's Jehovah Sabaoth, Sabe, Sabe, or Jehovah Sabaoth. He's the Lord of hosts. I love that one because that's Jehovah the mighty warrior, right? And when you see this, you talk, this is the, the Lord that goes and he fights your battles for you, right? When this is where you see that when in, in 2 Chronicles with Jehoshaphat, it said that they went in the name of the Lord of the host, right? The Lord of the host was the one that went and fought for him. He's that mighty warrior. And has he ever been defeated? Will he ever be defeated? No, right? Has he ever lost a battle? And he's not going to start now, right? That's, it's, he is fighting for me. That's encouraging. Um, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? He's our sanctifier. Anybody need sanctified? Right? Anybody need to be sanctified? He's our, I put Nisi on there twice. Um, he's our creator. Right? We talk about that. He's our sustainer. Right? He created the earth. He sustains the earth. He holds it all together. Right? We talked about that. Do you understand that the earth is spinning on an axis at exactly the right speed? And that if it changes by one little bit, man, we would just like all fly off the face of the earth. Right? That's how precise he is. He holds it all together. He's, he's holding you together. When you feel like you're falling apart, can I tell you that he's holding you together? 
You won't fall apart because he holds all things together. He's the upholder. He's the sustainer. He's wonderful. He's counselor. He's mighty God. He's everlasting father. He's the prince of peace. He dwells in unapproachable light. He's eternal. He's light. And there's scripture for all of this. And in him is no darkness. He's uncreated. He's unchangeable. He's omnipotent or he's omnipotent. He's all powerful. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere all the time. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. He knows everything about everything. He's the father of glory. He's the father of lights. He's the father of mercies. He's the father of spirits. And there's mercies again. He's righteous and a just father. He's a holy father. He's a good father. He's a kind father. He's merciful and a compassionate father. He is the great I am. Amen. Is there something in there that you need that he hasn't covered? Is there anything in your life that isn't covered by one of these names? And if so, would you tell me what it is? Right? That's a pretty good list, and that's probably not everything. But what does that tell us about it? What, what I'm going to encourage us to do is to ask him to reveal yourself to us in these ways. Teach me what it is to know you as Jehovah, sin committed by righteousness. Teach me how to know you fully as my creator. Because if he created me, who's responsible for me? Right? That, that's important. Right? My employer is my provider. If he's my provider, who's my provider? BMO Bank is not my provider. They sign the check. But he is not my provider. I was listening to someone today, and um, they said on a couple of occasions, God has told them to just empty their bank account out. And they struggled the first time. But he replenished it. He told them to do it again. And they emptied their bank account out. Down to a zero balance. Sold cars. Sold everything they had. But that same person testified about getting a check handed to her for $5 million. Because someone that started out with, I forgot, $50,000, God multiplied it to a quarter of a million, multiplied it to millions, and then multiplied it to billions, and told them, gave them a list of things to do, and they went all over the globe giving, starting churches and helping churches, and her church was on the list, and they gave her $5 million to start a church, and they bought her a house, and she didn't have to pay for it. Right? When we honor him and when we know him as our provider, we can make, we can do crazy things like that. How many of you would say that's bold? That's bold. How many of you would say that that takes faith? Yeah. Right? But how many of you say that that takes knowing your God? Amen. Right? But, but it happens. That's a real person. That's just somebody like you and I. Right? That just took that step of faith. And we'll never have to worry about, she can devote her life to ministry because she was willing to obey and God honored her faithfulness. Does that make sense? Yes. And that's that's the radical obedience. We can do that because he's our provider. If he asks us to give it all away, I can trust him because I know that he's gonna give it back to me because his word can't lie. He says, if you give, I'm gonna give it back to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Right, isn't that his word, right? If we give, he always gives back more. That's, that's because he's our provider. So this is what, when anything that you need, he, he, it's here. And that's what we need to do is start praying this, start acknowledging who he is. When we worship him, take this list and start acknowledging who he is. If you're battling something in your life, that's who you, you acknowledge and you exalt that name of him in your life. Before you even ask him to meet your need, exalt that characteristic of him. Does that make sense? If you need a healing, worship him as Jehovah Rapha, your healer. Right? Make him higher than your sickness. If you need a financial miracle, worship him as Jehovah Jireh, your provider. Does that make sense? If you need to forgive somebody, worship him as your redeemer and as your forgiver and as your savior. Right? So that's what we, this is what this is all about. It's about knowing who he is and beginning to pray by acknowledging who he is and by worshiping him for who he is. 
So often we want to worship him in the past tense for the things that he's done. And there's nothing wrong with that. We do give thanks for the things that he's done. The psalmist said that. But if we're not careful, we'll live in the past and the things that he's done. And we won't praise him for what he wants to do. Because he doesn't change. And he's still doing. He's still creating. Right? He's still doing new things. He's still answering prayer. He's still, he's still creating new things in people. He's still giving new dreams. He's still revitalizing. Right? He's still reviving. But so often, we just want to focus on what he's done. Let's start focusing on who he is. Because I, I don't, this is this is who we get. And, and, and this is what humbles me is to think he's all of these things. But yet he says to me, you can come in. You can come in and you can you can just boldly come to me. And you can ask what you want. Right? But I'm telling you, if we don't know who it is, we'll make the mistake of coming to him in arrogance. Anybody come like demanding? Have you ever been guilty of demanding that he do something? Anybody? Yeah, right. He's not going to answer that, right? Because we can't, we don't have the right to demand, and he's not going to do it because we're worthy. He's going to do it because he's worthy, right? Do you understand what I'm saying? And that's you know when he says come boldly, we think that that means we can just march into the throne room and tell him what he's going to do. It's not that at all. When you come boldly, that's coming boldly in humility. <coughs> Acknowledging who he is, casting your crown at your feet, you know, worshiping him. And then that that moves his heart. And someone said, when you move his heart, that moves his hand. Right? When you touch his heart, he moves his hand on your behalf. He's gonna do it. I only had one child. I didn't get to bear that out, but are we live streaming? I can't say that then. Um I'll refrain from saying that. Um but when people are kind to you, I'll just say it this way. Are you willing to go the extra mile? Right? Are you willing to do the extra if people are showing you respect and honor and love? Right? You are. If someone doesn't, it doesn't mean we won't do it, but it doesn't mean we're going to do it with as much joy. Right? Right? And, 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 and I'm not saying that God is like that, but I do think that there is something that when we come to him and we acknowledge, we have got that connection. <coughs> right? And, and we, have, we have his ear, we have his heart, and he looks down on us, and man, and he's just like, yeah. You know, you, you've been faithful. Because what did they say about Daniel? He said, he was faithful. Right? And I'm telling you, faithfulness carries weight in the kingdom. We see it all the time. Noah was righteous. Abraham was righteous. All the time he's using people that had his heart. So what is worship? It's rehearsing the character of God and his ways and reminding him of his faithfulness and his promises. Um, and we see this in Jeremiah 32. Let's turn there for a second. And... Um, <coughs> These are just, again, prayers in the Bible. What am I, why are we going through these prayers in the Bible? To show you that the Lord's Prayer is prayed this way all through the Bible. It just wasn't prayed this way in the New Testament. This is how people prayed all throughout Scripture. Uh, before the Lord's Prayer was even taught, you look at Jeremiah and Jeremiah 32, starting at verse 16. Let's just go through this in verse 16. Now, when I had delivered, um, I prayed to the Lord, saying, Verse 17, what does he say? Ah, Lord God. Frank, what's that next word? Oh, you don't have it. Behold. What does it mean, Frank? Yeah. What does behold mean? Pay attention. Yeah, what does, he, what does he want us to pay attention to? Right. Ah, and this is, ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power. Your attention. And your outstretched arm. This is the prophet Jeremiah praying this prayer. Jeremiah knew his God, right? Who was he praying to? He was praying to a God that was great in power, right? He was praying to a God that created everything. Jeremiah needed God to move on the behalf of the people. So he's praying to the God that can move on behalf of his people. And he's acknowledging that, right? There is nothing too hard for you. And, and that's what we need to know. When I look at those names, when I look at those characteristics, and I look at Jeremiah and say, is any, if you can create the world, is there anything too hard for you? Well, he 
answer is no. And if you don't like Old Testament, go to the New Testament. Because he says, I'm the one for whom nothing is impossible. And he said it in the other way, all things are possible. So whether you like the negative or the positive, he says it both ways, he's got you covered. Nothing is impossible, all things are possible. Right? Isn't anything too difficult for you? No. You created the heavens and the earth by your great power and your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult. You show loving kindness. Praise him for his loving kindness to thousands. But you also are just, you repay the iniquity um, for those that are sin against you. And you are the great and the mighty God whose name is the Lord of hosts. What is that? Jehovah Sabah. Right there it is again, right? So you're mighty, and you're the, the mighty warrior. A mighty God, you're a mighty warrior. You're great in counselor. What was one of his names? Counselor, counselor right? And you're mighty in work, for your eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men. Your eyes are open. What is he there? Who is the God who sees? Right? He's El Roy, right? So your eye, you see this? this? The people knew their God. And when they prayed, they didn't have to think about what they were going to say. They were convinced of who he was, and this is how they naturally prayed. Understand that, right? A little different than just saying, I love you, I love you, I love you, I praise you, I praise you, I praise you. You understand what I'm saying? Right? You are great in counsel, and you see, um, and you give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings, right? He's a provider. You have set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt to this day and in Israel, among other men, and you have made yourself a name as it is in this day, right? So he's, he, he's great in power, he's mighty in need. Nothing is too difficult. Um, he's a deliverer. You've brought your people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. And there it is, and your, your hand is strong. Um, you've given them this land of which you swore to their fathers, right? And they came and they took possession of it. Um, and he goes on, right? But you look at that first part of that, and this is all he's doing, is exalting who his God was. You need a prayer to pray? Go to Jeremiah 32 and start with that. You want to know how to worship him? Start right there, because that's a pretty powerful prayer, isn't it? Right. Is that, I mean, do you think that that's going to get the attention of God? I think it will. And this is a prayer that's right in scripture. It's right there in black and white for us to avail ourselves to. And then you look in, and let's go back to Daniel for a little bit. And I will, um, we'll close with a couple of Daniel's prayers. I, I, I you know, Daniel, we don't, um, we don't talk a lot about Daniel. But can I tell you, he was quite an amazing, amazing uh, young person. I mean, he was, he was young. Um, and in chapter 2, he had just, um, the, the king wants him to um, interpret a dream. And in Daniel 2, 19, look at how he starts his prayer, right? And um, again, keep in mind, he's wanting Nebuchadnezzar to, re uh, he, Nebuchadnezzar is wanting him to reveal a dream that he had and to interpret it. And this is what he's praying. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, right? He's the everlasting one, right? He's El Olam, Right? For wisdom and might are his. He's counselor. He's wisdom. He changes the times and seasons. He removes kings and, rise, and rises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. So you see what Daniel <coughs> needs here? Do you see what's happening here? He needs wisdom, right? He needs to hear a word from the Lord. He needs to know how to take this dream that Neb Nebuchadnezzar <coughs> had. And he needs to say, how do I, what's the, what's the interpretation? Because for the people that got it wrong, it didn't end well for them. You understand that? You didn't interpret a king's dream right. It didn't usually end well for you. Right? right? So he's coming to God, and that's what he needs. I need wisdom on what this dream means. What's he acknowledging about God? You're a counselor. You're wise. You give wisdom to the wise. You give knowledge to those who have understanding. You reveal deep and secret things. You know what's in the darkness, and light dwells with you. I thank you and I praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might, and have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's demand. Do you, under, do you see what I'm trying to get across here? That you acknowledge who he is when you pray for what, right? Whatever your need is, you take that characteristic of who he is, and you acknowledge that. That's what Daniel did. That's what Jeremiah did. You worship him for who he is. Did Daniel ever ask God to give him the dream? The dream, the answer came through worship. Do you see that? 
Therefore Daniel went to Ariok, whom the king had appointed to destroy, and he said, do not destroy. And it says that he answered the king. So, so that's, that's why worship is so important. We want to skip the worship and get right into the asking. But can I tell you, develop a habit of worship. Develop a habit of spending time acknowledging who he is. And when you have a need, find scripture about that need and exalt him for who he is. Right? Because he is the one that you need. You don't need the answer. You need him. And understand that. Does that make sense? Yeah. We don't like that, right? Because there are some things that his answer is going to be no. But if you have him. You're okay. Doesn't change that, right? But this is what we see Daniel doing. Look in Daniel 9. It's another instance. Um, 9, um, chapter 3, uh, verse 9. And this is Daniel praying for the people of, um, of Israel, right? Because they're in, they're, in, they're in captivity. And he says, I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord, who? My God, who are we praying to? Our, right? We talked about that last week. He's a personal God. And this is what David is saying. I prayed to the Lord, my God, and I made confession. That's a part of it. Forgive me of my sin, right? And I said, oh Lord, great and awesome God. And here it is again. He starts his prayer with worship. Oh Lord, great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and mercy. Now remember, Israel's in a backsliding condition, right? They've rejected their God, have they not? Yeah. And as a result of their rejection, what did God take right through the prophet Jeremiah? What did he say would happen to them? You're going to live 70 years in captivity, right? This is their punishment. Captivity was their punishment for their worship of foreign gods, right? And they, so what is David praying? The Israel needs to be saved. Israel needs to turn their heart back to God. So what's David, how is he, what is David approaching him as? You're a God who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love them, will love him, and with those who keep his commandments. And he says, we have sinned, and we've committed iniquity. We have done wickedly, and we have rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets who spoke in your name to our king, right? This is that part of the prayer where it's confession. He's telling God, this is what we've, we've, we've sinned. I've done wrong, right? And this is part of that. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. And this is what he's praying here. Um, oh Lord, righteousness, right, belongs to you. He's Jehovah Sid Canoe. He is our righteousness, right? But, uh, but to us, shame of face, as it is this day, to the men of Judah. Um, I'm just going to skip a little bit. Um, talks about their un unfaithfulness. And um, number nine, verse nine, to the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness. Right? That's what, that's what they need. And that's what he's saying. You're a forgiving God. You're a merciful God. Um, we rebelled against you, but we need your mercy. Right? I know you as mercy. Um, and we've not obeyed your, your, your words. He goes on to say, um, you know, disaster is coming upon us. Um, but then there's it, our Lord, the Lord, our God. Um, and again, in verse 14, the Lord, our God is righteous in all the works he does, though we have not obeyed his voice. Right. So he's appealing to his righteousness. Um, and he's reminding him, you see now in verse 15, he goes to reminding him of what he's done in the past. You've delivered them and, and with a mighty hand and you made yourself a name, right? You, you became their God. And we, have, we have, again, repentance. We have sinned and according to all your righteousness. Do you see this? He's contrasting the righteousness of God with the sinfulness of Israel, right? Understanding that it's his righteousness that we need. Right? Remember in the New Testament it says that he's clothed us in the righteousness of Christ Jesus. That if we have been born again, we are clothed in the righteousness of his son. And that's what he's appealing to, this righteousness, this mercy um, that is found in Christ. Um, um, you know, hear our prayer and our supplication, right? There's that asking, give us this day our daily bread. So he's asking um, with the supplication, um, here, open your eyes, see us. Oh, Lord. Um, 
We don't come to you because of our righteous need, righteousness. Under, get that line. I don't come to you because I'm righteous. Because if we waited to come to him when we were righteous, when would we come to him? He would never come to him, would we? He said, I don't come to you. We don't come to you because we're righteous. Just the opposite. We understand how wicked we are. And I've always, that always reminds me of the prophet Isaiah when he saw the Lord. And he said, I saw him high and lifted up in the train of his robe. He saw God in all of his majesty. And the first thing he said was what? Three words. Whoa. When he saw God in his majesty, he saw him in his sinfulness. But you know what? He wasn't filled with, he wasn't filled with shame. He was filled with conviction and repentance. And there's no shame, right? Um, because of your great mercies, oh Lord, hear. Oh Lord, forgive. Oh Lord, listen and act. Can I tell you that's all you need to pray? Oh Lord, hear. Oh Lord, forgive. Oh Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. And that's powerful stuff. And I encourage you, it's it's 7.30, I will close with one last thing, and then we'll go on to thy kingdom come next week. But I'm telling you, man, when you understand and when you pray, Father, teach me who you are. Holy Spirit, teach me who you are. Help me to know, not head knowledge. I don't want to just know Jehovah, Sidkenu, righteousness, Elohim, the everlasting one, Jehovah Jireh, my provider, Jehovah Rapha, my healer, Jehovah Nisi, my banner. Right? I can go out and rabble them off. I have the head knowledge, but man, I want to know the heart knowledge. Father, I want to know you as my provider. I want to know you so much that I know that if you ask me to give everything away, that you're going to take care of me, that it's going to be all right, that I can write that check and I can take that account down to zero, knowing that you're going to be, you're going to give me back whatever you think I need, right? I want to know you as healer. I just want, don't, don't want to know that you are a healer. I want to know you as healer. So when I get that diagnosis and when the doctors come in and they say, hey, there's nothing that we can do, I can say, but that's okay because I know the healer. I know him as healer. And I know that he's the healer. Right? When I'm feeling unloved. Right? So it doesn't matter if I don't feel loved by anybody else, but I know that he loves me because he is love. That's what his word says, right? When everything around me is in turmoil and there's the, 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 right, the, the, the storm is there, I don't have to worry if my boat's being tossed, right? Because I know that he's my peace, right? And I know that as long as I'm in the boat with him, it doesn't matter how badly the boat is, ro- is, is, is rocking because I know him as peace. I know he's peace and I have confidence that it doesn't matter what it looks like and it doesn't matter how badly my world is shaking, I know that he's peace and I know that I can rest in him because it says that in his presence, he's told Moses, I will go with you and in my presence, I'll give you rest, right? So he can speak to the anxiety because I know him and he is peace. Does that make, does does this make sense? Absolutely. Right? And this is how we have to know him. We all know it. We can all say he's peace. But there's a difference between knowing it and knowing it. It's the hardest thing to get it from these 12 inches from here to here. Because we've taken all the Sunday school classes, right? We've read all the books. But we haven't prayed it into our spirit. Right? We have it up here. And I heard someone say it like this. It's good that we get in the word, but we got to make sure that the word gets in us. Mm-hmm. Right? We got to make sure that the word gets in us. And that's why he said, um, 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 that we have to know that, um, sorry, I just got a text. Um, we're going to pray when, it, when I'm done. Because it's something that needs prayer. But um, we got to know that he's, he's those things, right? And that whatever we need, he is that. And we have to get his word in him. And, and I, I, I will close briefly with this in John 6. He just fed the 5,000. And the people showed up the next morning. And they said, where's the bread? They didn't 
want him. They wanted what he had to give them. Go back and read it. Here's the bread. And he teaches them, and he says, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. Why do you want what I have in my hand when you can have me? That's in essence what he's saying. You have me, you have all you need. Right? And that's what we need to know. We need to know him as those things because that's who he is to us. And if we have that, we have all that we need. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So get him, get in the word. Eat, taste and see that the Lord is good. Right? Taste it. Get it. The word in you, not just in your mind. Any thoughts, any questions? Go ahead, Frank. <laughs> if I get anything out of tonight, worship. Pray what you're doing tonight. You know what just struck me? When you said praise him for what he, who he is to you. Yeah. See, that's, think about what you just said. Uh, pray, praise him for what, don't worry about what he is to James, but what he is to you, you praise him for yeah. that. If you got a headache, praise him for that. If you got a heartache, praise him for that. That's right. Just praise him for what he is to you. He'll take care of everything. Now that's pretty powerful. Yes, it is. He's pretty good God to, to put yes, that in his word, right? And that and it, it, it's that simple, right? But man, prayer starts with worship. I, it's not a coincidence that he took us to the place of worship first because I, I'm convinced that it puts him in the right place and it magnifies him. And I said it earlier, and I'll, I'll end with this. If your problems seem too big, look to Jesus. If your problems seem overwhelming, look to Jesus, right? Um, because when you get things in the proper perspective, right? I don't know why, and I don't even know that this ties in, but when Brittany was little, she loved moons and airplanes. And she was just a little thing. And she would go out and she would look up in the moon and she would be, moon, I'm my yig, right? Because in her mind, she could reach up with her little, you know, two-year-old hand and she could grab that moon, right? That moon was small to her. You understand what I'm saying? And then that's what we have to have, an, air, an airplane. Airplane, yen on my yeg. You know, that airplane was like this. She didn't realize the magnitude of that airplane because she thought she was big. And can I tell you, that's how we need to approach it, right? Problems, you just land on my leg because you're not big, right? My God is bigger than that. And, um, and that's the place we've got to understand who he is. I challenge you, reveal to me who you are and how big you are. How great is your God? And start asking your problems, was he able? Because he was able. He always will be able. Anything else? Before we go, um, can I ask that we pray for my mom? Um, my sister just texted me. She's got, um, um, and my sister is an infectious disease uh, nurse practitioner, so she thinks she has a bladder or a UTI. Um, she was catheterized, so, um, she said she's got some pain and she's got some blood in her urine. So can we, I believe that he's Baca, right? He's healer. Yes, yes. I don't. I believe tomorrow morning when she wakes up, there will be no blood in her urine, right? I believe that he's got her this far and the enemy is just coming in and trying. And you know what? My sister's not a believer. She's brave, but she's not a believer. Um, and I believe that God can do the miraculous. And I believe that, right? We don't pray for God to give signs. Signs follow those that believe and those that, believe, that see the signs believe, right? Um, I thought you were going to say just yeah. So can we, can we, will you agree with me yes. that he's going to be Rafa, right? And that's what we're going to do. We're going to praise him as Rafa. I'm not even going to ask you to ask him to heal her. I'm just going to ask you to join me in praising him as Rafa and exalting him and making him bigger than the problem. Right. Can we do that? Can we do that? Yes. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you. God, because you are healer. God, you are the one that created God, you are the one that formed that kidney, that you're the one that formed that bladder, God. You're the one that created every cell that's in her body, Father. God, you are a healer, and you are the creator, and there is nothing that is too difficult for you, Father. God, and I praise you for that today, God. You created the heavens and the earth with your outstretched arm, Father. God, is anything too difficult for you, Father? There's nothing too difficult for you, Father. God, if you created her, you can repair her, Father. God, if you created her, you can speak healing into her body, Father God. There is nothing too difficult for you, Father. God, this is nothing. This is just this is just a snap of your finger and it's done, Father. God, you're that great. You are her provider. You're her caregiver, Father.
Father. God, you are everything that she needs, Father God. You are God and you are God alone. You're all powerful. You're all knowing. You're all you're all seeing, Father God. You see her right now, God. You are her strength, Father God. You are her healer. Father, I thank you, Father God, for what you're doing in her life, Father God. I praise you, Father. God, for the report, God, that we're going to believe, Father God, for. I know, Jesus, that with you, God, all things are possible, and nothing is impossible to those that believe, Father God. And I come before you, God. You said in your word that if any two agree as to touching anything, Father God, there's more than two people that are agreeing in faith here tonight, God. And I just thank you for what you're doing, Father. God, I thank you for what you're doing in your people, Father. God, I pray that that you would reveal yourself to them in mighty ways in the coming weeks, Father God, that they would give a revelation, fresh revelation of your greatness, of your mightiness, of your power, Father God, that you would begin to understand more deeply, Father God, how truly great you are, that you are the God that tells the sea, this far you shall go and no more. You're the one that hangs the heavens like a curtain. You're the one who measures the water in the palm of your hand, Father. God, you are the one for whom nothing is too difficult. You're God over every other God. You're sovereign. You're mighty. And you love us. You're a good father. That is who you are. You're a way maker. You're a miracle worker, Jesus. That is who you are. God, you're a reviver. You're a redeemer. You're savior. You're sanctifier. You're holy. You're righteous. You are the one who loves us. That is who God, you're the one that we live and we move and we have our being in. God, it's our breath that's in our lungs. You've given us the breath to praise you. Why won't we praise you? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, I worship you. God, I exalt your name. Thank you, Lord. Father God, help us, Jesus. Help our unbelief. Help our unbelief, Jesus. Scripture, God, that if we would lift you up, Father. God, I, I, I was, I was praying, I was reading again about how Aaron and, and, and the priest and that said that you make him garments for for holiness and for beauty, for glory and for beauty. God, that's what we want us to be. God, that our sole purpose is to minister to you, to worship you, to be become that royal priesthood. 
Father, when we worship you, when we minister to you, Father God, when we lift you up, God, your word says that you'll draw people to you. God, we can't we can't make anybody come to you. But your word says that if we will lift you up, that you will draw. Nobody can come to the Father except the Father draws them. Father God, and how do we do? How do we make that happen on earth? We'll talk about that next week. Your kingdom come. We do it by exalting you. God, let us see the importance of worship, of knowing you, and giving you the honor and the glory that's due your name. God, it is the apex, and it's the core of everything we do. Teach us how to pray. Teach us how to worship. Teach us how to trust. I love you, Father. I thank you for